Okay, good afternoon. So we're going to continue talking about um, the trig functions today. Well, as one might expect in a trigonometric three course. So we've defined the sine and the cosine in terms of right triangles. And then we've basically defined the other trig functions in terms of the sine and the cosine. So, so remember of where we are. We said that the sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse and the cosine of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And although I said sine and cosine, I should have said sine, cosine, and tangent. Tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. And then you can define the remaining trig functions in terms of these sides, but what you normally say now is the secant is one over the cosine and the cosecant is one over the sine and the cotangent you might say is one over the tangent. Yeah, let's, let's leave it at that for now. So with this definition, we can define the sine and the cosine and so on of a limited number of angles because theta is a non right angle of a right triangle, theta is stuck between pi over two radians or 90 degrees, if you prefer. So theta has to be a positive number between those other numbers in order for these definitions to make sense. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to modify this definition or come up with a new definition so that we can take the sine, cosine, and so forth of any number or positive or negative, big or small. And the way we do this when we first see it, it um, probably seems like a kind of arbitrary way to go about defining um, these trig functions. But we'll start by defining the unit circle. It's a circle, as one might expect from the name, a radius of one, centered at the origin. It's as an equation, it's x squared plus y squared equals one. We don't actually need that equation. We just need this circle. So this is the point one is zero, zero, one. Negative one, zero, zero, negative one. And we have a number theta. 
And let's think of theta as an angle. We often take the sine and cosine of things that aren't angles, but for the purposes of this definition, that theta be an angle. And specifically, that theta be an angle in the standard position so that the origin is its vertex and the x-axis is the initial side. And now theta can be whatever. Theta doesn't have to be between zero and pi over two. Theta could be bigger than that. So theta might be in the third quadrant or theta could be negative, so the angle looks like that. It could be bigger than pi over two. So we could have an angle like that. Whatever, theta is just any angle. Positive, negative, big, small. But for the purposes of my picture, let's let that theta just look like this. Well, you see that line segment hits the unit circle. Now this point on the unit circle as an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. And we're going to say the x-coordinate is the cosine of theta and the y-coordinate is the sine of theta. And this, as I say, is not probably the most intuitive way to define a function, but it does work. In the following sense, we have this angle theta, What I'm drawing on the next frame is that right triangle. This is one because this is a unit circle and that radius is there for one. So the x-coordinate of this point is that leg of the triangle. The y-coordinate of this point is this leg of the triangle. And notice that this is precisely what we get if we use the right triangle definition. The sine of theta should be the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the right triangle definition says that the sine of theta was the sine of theta, which one had, had better hope is true. So it seems, it might seem like a problem that we have two different definitions of the sine and the cosine. 
because which definition do we use? Well, what this frame is telling us is that when is theta is between a zero and pi over two, and we can use the right triangle definition. The definitions match. There's no risk that you're going to use the right triangle definition and somebody else is going to use the unit circle definition and you're going to get different things. So even though this might seem like a kind of weird way of defining the sine and the cosine, it does do what we expect it to do in terms of right triangles. And traditionally, you use the unit circle to define the sine and the cosine, and then you just define all the other trig functions in terms of those, which so we've defined the sine of theta to be the y-coordinate of a point, and the cosine of theta to be an x-coordinate of a point. And where this is different from the right triangle is that with the right triangle, the tangent is usually defined as its own thing. It's the toa part of Sokotoa, or the take oats away part of that mnemonic. Um, usually when you're using right triangles, you don't do that. The tangent is defined to be the sine over the cosine. Likewise, the cotangent is either defined to be one over the tangent or if you prefer, you could define the cotangent to be the cosine over the sine. The cosecant is one over the sine. The secant is one over the cosine. So aside from the fact that now we're defining the tangent in terms of the sine and the cosine, instead of having it be its own thing. This is just what we did with right triangles. I mean, this definition of the secant and the cosecant is just what we had, again, with right triangles. As a bit of trivia, <laughs> it's not in your textbook, and it's not traditionally taught. There are ways of using the unit circle to define the tangent, the cosecant, the secant, and the cotangent directly. And as I say, those aren't usually taught, but I'm going to show you just one, because I think it's kind of interesting. We've seen the word tangent 
used in various ways, like in our high school and now in our college career. You've seen the tangent as a trig function. And you've also probably at some point run across the idea of a tangent line. A line that just brushes up against a circle like that. And it might at some point have occurred to you to wonder, as it certainly occurred to me, why is the same word being used for both of these things? They seem as if they're, they should be totally different. Well, if we take the point, where this radius intersects the circle, and we draw the tangent line, we get a new right triangle. And the tangent of theta is the length of that tangent line segment. This is the reason that the tangent is called the tangent. The circle stuff came first, and then when the trig functions were being defined, the tangent trig function got named that because it was defined in terms of a tangent line. Having said that, for our purposes, we're going to be thinking of the tangent as the sine over the cosine. So, we can find the sine and the cosine of a few classic angles. I should say, let me say this in writing, the sine and cosine of any number is defined. You can take any number, you can think of it as an angle. Again, if you don't see a degree symbol, you're thinking of it as an angle in radians. And most of the time you won't see a degree symbol. Most of the time when we're working with these functions, we'll be working in radians but you have any number, you think of it as an angle, you draw the angle, there's a, you look at this point, it's got an X coordinate, it's got a Y coordinate, you've got your sine and your cosine. The other trade functions, can be undefined. Why would that be? What is there about these definitions that would cause the other trig functions to be undefined? 
<clears throat> if you take the sign, for example, like the sign of zero will give you one, right? Mm -hmm. I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that any of these other ones, if you get a zero underneath, it would make it undefined. Yes, that's exactly correct. Thank you. Well, these other four trig functions all have division in them, and you can't divide by zero. So these can be undefined because of a division by zero error. Let's look um, at some sines and cosines of angles that are on the X. So ordinarily, you're not going to be able to find the sine and cosine of a number in your head. You're going to have to go to a calculator. And that's okay, because a lot of functions are like that. What's the square root of seven? I don't know. Go to a calculator and get a decimal approximation. But there are a few sort of fam famous is a weird word to use in a trigonometry class, but there are some kind of significant angles, let's say, whose sine and cosine we should be able to work out. So let's start with the zero. And you don't see a symbol, so this is zero radians. So we've got our unit circle and an angle of zero. means we are right there. Our initial segment and our terminal segment are the same. And the point where that segment hits the circle is right on the axis. It's one comma zero. And the zero, I hope, is pretty self-explanatory. It's on the x-axis. The one comes from the fact that this is a unit circle. Its radius is one. So, The cosine of zero is the x coordinate of that point, which is one. The sine of zero is the y coordinate of that point, which is zero. Bless you. The tangent of theta. Rather, not theta, we've got a specific number here. The tangent of zero is the sine over the cosine. And this sometimes trips people up because they remember that you can't divide by zero and think, well, you should be able to have a zero in the top either, but the tangent of zero is zero. 
zero divided by one is one. The secant of zero is one over the cosine of zero, which is a perfectly nice number. The cosine of zero is one. One divided by one is one. The cosecant of zero now here something goes wrong. The sine of zero is zero, and we cannot divide one by zero, so the cosecant of zero is not defined. And let me see, that leaves us with the cotangent. I am so used to writing theta that when circular, circular motion starts, I have to check it. Um, the cotangent of zero So I defined the cotangent in two ways. I said, well, it's one over the tangent, but that's also the cosine over the sine. Either way, um, let's say we use the cosine over the sine definition, we once again get a division by zero error. So the cosine and sine are defined, but um, the cosecant and cotangent aren't. The secant and tangent are, as we see. And then we can repeat this process. It might get a little tedious, but these are these genuinely are important angles. I wouldn't spend our time on this if it weren't, if they weren't. We can look at pi divided by two. And again, we're going to be working with radians probably more often than not, or at least we are in the, this and the next chapter. So if you um, haven't sort of internalized this, it's good to internalize it now. 90 degrees is pi over two radians. We look at the angle. We look at the point. Again, I hope that x equals zero is kind of self-explanatory, where on the y-axis, all the x-coordinates are zero. Y being one, again, comes from the fact that this is a unit circle. So let's try to strike a balance in terms of how long this takes us. But let's put down the trig functions, the cosine and the sine.
So the what's the cosecant? One. I'm hearing one. And I agree with that. The cosecant is one divided by the sine. And the sine we have seen is one. So the cosecant is one. What about the secant? Just be one. Over um, cosine pi over two, or cosine pi over two. That's correct. It is in this particular case because the cosine is zero. That causes this to not be defined. And then filling in the rest, the tangent is also not defined. So here's one, let's see, well, let me say the cotangent is the cosine over the sine. Zero over one equals one. I've also said the cotangent is one divided by the tangent. Um, that actually doesn't work here. The tangent is not defined. So one divided by the tangent also isn't defined. But the cotangent is. The cotangent is zero. So let me say, let me phrase this as saying that the cosine over the sine is the main definition. And in this situation, even though the one over the tangent definition doesn't work, the cosine over the sine definition does, and that gives us the cotangent. Let's not linger on this. But I hope I'm not saying that and then lingering. A straight line, which would be 180 degrees, is high radians. This is negative one zero. So some stuff's going to be negative here because our cosine has a negative x co, a negative value. Uh, in particular, the sine is the y coordinate, the cosine is the x coordinate, then the tangent of theta. Now the tangent of theta ends up being zero. Would it be theta or would it be pi? You are correct. Thank you. This is my Pavlovian instinct at this point. Um, so the cotangent of pi is Let's see, the cosine over the sine, which is not 
defined the secant theorem. I knew something else had to be negative. The secant is one divided by the cosine. So the secant is negative. And then the cosecant, one over the sine is not Defined. I mean, I guess the other angles we could do, but I, I think I won't do them. I think I'll leave them to your imagination. This angle is three pi divided by two. On the unit circle, this is the point zero comma negative one. And you can find the, the cosine is zero. The sine is negative one. The other four trig functions are the appropriate fractions. Any questions about that? Then let me spend the remainder of the class period looking at something that's not directly related to just, well, it's, it's sort of related. Looking at a famous identity called the Pythagorean identity. An identity is an equality that's always true. So for example, This is an identity that x plus y equals y plus x. It doesn't matter what x is. It doesn't matter what y is. This is the statement of commutativity. It's the statement that order does not matter when you do addition, and it is always a true statement. This is in contrast to something like one plus x equals five. This is not an identity because it's not always true. It's true. for exactly one value of x. It's true when x is four, but it's false for any value of x. So it's not always true. It can be true or false. And the Pythagorean identity, let me write it out and then let me write it out again in a slightly different way. The Pythagorean identity says 
that the sine of x squared plus the cosine of x squared equals one. And that is an identity. It is always true. X can be big or small. X can be positive or negative. X can be measured in radians or X can be measured in degrees. The Pythagorean identity always holds. Can X be measured in radians or degrees? Surely, yeah. Um, so let me first say where this comes from. I mean, the word Pythagorean is a, is a name you know, a word you know, and it's just, let me find where, here, the Pythagorean identity, is just coming from this picture. The sine and the cosine are legs of a right triangle. One is the hypotenuse of the right triangle. The Pythagorean theorem says that one of the legs square plus the other leg squared equals the hypotenuse squared. And because the hypotenuse is one and one squared is one, we don't need to write that. And we get the Pythagorean identity. The Pythagorean identity is usually not written quite like this because we have special or at least unusual notation for powers of trig functions. And the reason we have special notation is to try to minimize the parentheses that we're having to write on the whiteboard and in our homework and so on. So here, you notice that I put the sine of x and the cosine of x in parentheses. And the reason for that is that if I didn't have parentheses, you could look at this and you could misunderstand it. You could think that what I have written here means that the x is being squared instead of the sine and instead of the cosine. And that is wrong. It is not the x being squared. It is indeed the sine of x and the cosine of x. So if we just drop the parentheses, it's ambiguous. But also, we don't want to have to write parentheses every time we raise a sine or a cosine to a power. So what we do instead is put the power between the name of the trig function, S-I-N in this case, COS in this case. And we write the Pythagorean identity like so. And when we see this sin squared x, that's another way of writing the sine of x squared. 
squared. And similarly, cos squared x is just another way of writing the cosine of x squared. Um, and the Pythagorean theorem is immense. The Pythagorean identity, I should say, is extremely important. And one of those things that at least for this class, you really should commit to memory. I mean, I know probably neither of your majors, you've either taken calc to this or are not going to take it. So it's not as important for you as it could be for some students. It's really important to know it if in calculus, we will use it throughout this course as well. Though. So this you should memorize. And the really good applications I feel like either occur in calculus or are going to occur later. But we can do an example. Let's say that theta is between zero and pi over two. And we're told that the sine of theta is one-fifth. Let's find the cosine of theta. And we don't know what theta is, but we don't need to know what theta is. We know with a sign, we want a cosine. And the Pythagorean identity relates the sign and the cosine. So one fifth squared plus the cosine squared is one, one twenty fifth plus the cosine squared is one. The cosine squared is a uh, 24 25ths. Let's fix that numerator. And now something kind of interesting happened. And we're rushed for time now. We'll do another example on Wednesday. But this has two solutions. The cosine of theta could either be the positive or the negative square root of this number. And that is why I gave you a piece of information that's been hanging out there. I've said that theta is between zero and pi over two. So theta is somewhere in the first quadrant. And in the first quadrant, the, cos the x coordinates are all positive, and the y coordinates are all positive, meaning that the sign has to be positive, 
and the cosine has to be positive. So we're left with the positive square root. And as I say, I think we'll do another example with this on Wednesday, but for now, that brings us to the end of class. And again, I will see you Wednesday.